So here I have a Cobalt Strike sample loaded onto my malware analysis machine, and I'm going to show you some basic workflows and methods that you can use to use Ghidra to analyze it. So the first one of these is strings. You'll know if you do malware analysis that strings are something that you'll look at regularly. And one thing you can do with Ghidra is use string cross-references to build context around these strings. So if we open up Detect It Easy and do a string search, one string that really stands out is this percent %c, percent %c %mssse server, which is very commonly seen in Cobalt Strike. So if we open up our sample inside of Ghidra, we can actually use Ghidra to establish some more context on what that string is doing. So if we go up here and we go into a search and we use four strings, we can search for all blocks. And what we can do is just do a filter on that string we already found, which has that MSSE string. So we can see that it's found that and it's shown us the location in memory. Now what we can do from here is we can use a cross-reference to see where that string is used. Uh, Ghidra has identified one available cross-reference. We can either click the reference here or we can right-click and go to References, Show References to Address. And that allows us to see where that string is used. And in this case, that string has been applied inside of a printf operation, and it is actually used as a format string. So it's used to create a value which goes into this data location. And that's not super useful on its own, so we can go ahead and click on that data location. We can look at the cross-references available there, and we can see where it's actually used. And using that cross-reference, we can see that that value that ending in 89BO is actually the name of a named pipe, which is used by Cobalt Strike. Now, we know this data location ends in 89BO, and if we jump backwards to our string cross-reference, we can see that this is the same value where this string is being written to. So that's the first use case. We can use Ghidra to identify the context of a string, which in this case, this string is a format string used to create the name of a named pipe. Now, one of the second workflows we can do is we can look at the entropy of the file. In this case, there aren't actually any particularly high areas of entropy. And the reason for that is that the high entropy area in this sample is so small that it doesn't actually show up here. But if we go into Ghidra and we enable the entropy view, it will give us this little sidebar here, which if we show the legend, shows us the entropy within the file. Now, for some reason, in dark mode, the labels are gone, but effectively, the more white or the more red an area is, the higher the entropy and the more suspicious that it is. So if we click on this little area here, which is the most, the most high entropy area available here, we'll jump to this random, random area of code, which doesn't really have any meaning. But if we go ahead and we use the most recent label feature within Ghidra, we set this to backwards because we want to find the start of this data. And then we hit the label, which is the L button up here. We can actually see the start of this high entropy area. And again, we can use a cross-reference to see where it's used. So this high entropy area starts at a value of 404014. And we can hit X or show cross-references. And we can see where it's actually used. And we can see here that that area is the first argument to this function. Here. And if we click on that first argument, we can see that it's passed into the write file function. It is the second argument, so it's the LP buffer. And effectively, the content is being written into a named pipe, which is the same named pipe which was created by that MSSE string that we observed before. So the point here is that if you can find an area of high entropy, you can use Ghidra and previous labels to find the start of it. And then we can use cross-references to find out where that high entropy area is accessed, which in this case is this argument here. And if we click on the argument, we can see that it's passed into a named pipe. It's actually written into a named pipe, which is the exact same one we found in the initial analysis. Third thing we can do is, again, using Detected Easy, we can look at the import table. And if we scroll through the imports, we can see references to virtual alloc and virtual protect, which if you've done any malware analysis, these are some kind of suspicious APIs that are commonly used to create new areas of memory for suspicious code to be executed from. Now, we know that virtual alloc and virtual protect are used, but we don't know where. Again, we can go back to Ghidra. We can go to this right left-hand side into the import table, and we can just filter on virtual alloc. We can click on virtual alloc, right-click, and go show references to. 
And what we want to look for is any call operations to that API. We can click on the call operation, which will take us to this function here. And here we can see where virtual alloc is actually used. Now virtual alloc creates a memory buffer, which it returns after being called. And it looks like that is being assigned to this LP address function. And if we follow this LP, ad sorry, LP address variable, and if we follow this LP address using cursor text highlighting, we can see that it's actually part of an XOR operation, which is over here. After the XOR operation is performed, we can see the call to virtual protect and then a call to create thread. And this is a very common sequence of APIs when memory is being allocated, some kind of obfuscated content is being written to that new memory, the protection is being changed, and then the result is being executed. And Something we can also do with Deidre to get a better look at this is we can open up the function graph and we can look for any looping operations that contain suspicious instructions like XOR. And in this case, if we zoom out, we can see this loop here. And if we zoom in, we can see an XOR operation in here. So we can also see an increment operation. And that's a very common pattern uh, within decryption functions, or at least decryption logic. And another thing we can do here is now that we've identified the function which performs the memory allocation, protection change, and the thread creation, we can actually take it, we can take the starting address, which is here, and we can go into x64dbg, set a breakpoint on this function, and monitor what's happening. So I've opened up the file in x64dbg, and what I'm going to do is just type bp, and then provide the address of the function that we identified in Ghidra. and then I'm going to hit enter and allow the code to run. First we hit the entry point, we can hit run past that. Now we hit the breakpoint on the function that we identified with Ghidra. And if we look through, we can see that call to virtual alloc. We can see the same looping sequence with the XOR operation. And we can also see the call to virtual protect and create thread. So what we can do here is we can use a step over and we can step over the call to virtual alloc, at which point the address of the memory buffer will be in RAX. So we can go ahead and follow that in a dump. We can step over into this XOR loop. And if we step through this, we can slowly see that memory buffer being filled up. And we don't want to go through every single iteration, so what we can do is set a breakpoint on the end of the loop and then we can hit continue and that allows the loop to complete and now we can see our buffer is full of instructions. These instructions actually start with FC48 which is really common for shellcode. So we can potentially scan this dump looking for any plain text code and yeah we can see a user agent and also a C2 address potentially. If we skip over a little bit more we can see a call to virtual protect. So our memory buffer here is stored at 160000, so what we can do is follow this in the memory map and look at the current memory protections which are set to read-write. So this code can be read and modified but not executed. And after this call to virtual protect, if we step over it, this is now executable and readable but not writable. What we can also do here is we can actually set up an execute breakpoint on the beginning of this code because we suspect that it's shellcode and we can let the malware run and see if it triggers and it does we hit a hardware breakpoint execute on the memory buffer returned by virtual alloc so that confirms that this is something that is being executed we can also take these instructions and follow in disassembler and see if they decompile or disassemble correctly and in this case they do so this is very likely shellcode and now that the shellcode is loaded and we know that this is probably cobalt strike what we can do is scroll through the code a little bit through all of these instructions which are used to resolve APIs via API hashing and we can look for a jump RAX which will execute the result. We can set a breakpoint there and allow the code to run and we can see what APIs are being executed. The first one is load library A with this win inet string so it's going to be loading the win inet library. Second call is internet open A. Third call is internet connect A with a C2 address, which is the same, same one we saw at the very end of the shellcode in plaintext. 